So um, without further ado, I would love to welcome our first speaker. Are we ready? So um, the, for our first speaker today is Joanna Bryson, who's one of the instrumental players in the discussion of moral, legal, and commercial implications of AI. A professor of ethics and technology, Joanna will lead us through how to treat AI as a product and present what she believes in. So without further ado, please put your hands together for the brilliant Joanna Bryson. So I, uh, <laughs> this is how I got here. I put on my hiking boots. I saw it was white. I, I can't. Oh, I have to stand up here. I, yeah. So uh, I, I really cannot say I have had a great time. Uh, I've been posting on this hashtag here, <laughs> but the uh, <laughs> but the uh, but it would have been shorter if it was a U. So that would have been great. But uh, but I also am British, so I understand that not everyone here has a valid EU passport anymore, even though it says EU on it. Um, but anyway. Uh, thank you. I just can't say how flattering it is to be asked in Edinburgh after a night of drinking to talk about AI regulation. I mean, you guys either have incredible faith in me or else you realize that nobody cares about this topic. But <laughs> I, will, uh, I will go ahead because I care. And I'm really happy to everybody who's chosen to turn up to this room at this time, this hour. Okay. So first of all, and last of all, I will cover this at the beginning and the end. Is AI a product or a person? Um, a lot of people think that because I keep talking about things like that, you know, the A in artificial intelligence starts for artifact, that therefore I'm like an evil humanist. I didn't even know humanists could be evil, but uh, an evil anti-robot person. I want to just show you some of the pictures I took when I used to do uh, reviews of the European Commission. I love robots. Why do you think I got a PhD in AI? I love robots, right? They're so cute. Oh, it, feels, it doesn't feel empathy for that, right? But this is how they're made, right? We design everything about them. We choose whether or not they look like a person, right? This is a product, <laughs> okay? And this is a person. We don't get to choose, like, you know, does she have laser ra radar or does she care if she's uh, uh, left isolated for, for five years, right? We don't get to design that. We get to design that in AI. It's just different, okay? So I'm going to talk about governments and regulation because I've also run into some confusion about that. I'm really sorry for those of you who get it. Um, and then I'll talk specifically about the EU regulations relevant to us as developers. And I say us now as if, because I, I have been in, in industry a lot of years, but I know I'm an academic now, but I, I will, I will uh, pretend to be one of the uh, people that's selling this stuff. And then I'll talk about uh, some really big questions. I, this is not like I'm going to say, oh, yes, 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 or so it's all easy. There are some hard questions about whether or not the ideas of the EU are even implementable. And this, the conversations we were having yesterday we're important to that. And that's part of the reason I kept asking annoying questions. Sorry about that. <laughs> okay. And then we'll talk a little bit about the general purpose AI, uh, which, uh, which is uh, one of the things that some of uh, the entity formerly known as GAFAM have been calling their LLM. They've been calling this general purpose AI. So we'll talk about that. Okay, so what is regulation anyway? I think because I actually am a natural scientist, I actually think of regu regulation this way. Like, it's, it's how an organism keeps itself going, right? Breathing is a kind of regulation. There's up regulation, right? The, the reason there's different colors, some of that is positive regulation, some of that is negative regulation, right? And, and it's the same for governments. They do both positive and negative regulation, right? So regulation is the means the complex entity perpetuates some recognizable version of itself. Everybody dies, but these entities can go on longer than people, right? and our cells would get replaced, you know that? Governance is the subset of regulation that's explicit and deliberate, okay? So if you believe these definitions, and of course there's a million definitions of everything, but I'm just gonna use those in the terms of this talk, then, um, well, first of all, if we call something explicit if we can talk about it, which is again, right? Now, oh, AI has uh, the capacity to be explicit. Um, but then of course, every corporation is self-governing. Right? If it doesn't self-govern, it doesn't make it to the next day, right? It, it has to meet its payroll, it does these things, right? Of course they're all self-governing, but we also are governed by governments, and it's actually governments, we constitute governments, right? Governments are the way that geographically arranged areas coordinate, 
right? It's how we solve some of our problems. We offload some of the enforcement problems to an entity and we pay that entity to take care and simplify our control problems, right? It's not some alien that's landed here by a spaceship. <laughs> it's, some, it's mostly constituted of us. And I understand there's some countries where that's not entirely true, but, but basically that's the way that we try to coordinate things. So <clears throat> I've said this, uh, we, we, uh, I will say this again though. I unfortunately lived through both, uh, as I suppose a lot of people here, Brexit and Trump. I, I managed to <laughs> move across the ocean at exactly the wrong moment. And I saw so many people standing there saying, the government's done nothing for me. And it's like, you're speaking a language you've clearly learned at school. You're standing in a road and, and no one is robbing you. <laughs> you know, the air is relatively clean. We are surrounded by government and as we're starting to be surrounded by AI, that has been made invisible because that was thought to be a way to make, you know, to make us most effective, right? But it's becoming a problem that if things are too invisible, then other people aren't willing to pay for them and they don't see how it's working and, and they get freaked out by it. So I think my, my new tagline, one of my new taglines is, transparency requires apparency. Invisibility is not transparent, right? You, you need people to know what you're doing for them, or at least to have the capacity of finding out what you're doing for them. All right, so governments provide both upregulation. There isn't a government in the world that isn't trying to have a strong digital economy. Well, maybe Russia, okay? But there's hardly any, economy, any governments that aren't pumping money into our sectors, as well as sometimes restricting us. And even when they restrict us, often there's a reason. They're, they're pointing us at something. So I had people coming up to me uh, before the GDPR, you know, like Googlers and, and Microsofters, I don't even know what you call them. <laughs> but anyway, they, they're coming up to me and saying, we're gonna be gone, we're leaving the EU when you guys put in that ridiculous thing. I'm like, yeah, right, you're walking away from 350 million customers, right? But six months afterwards, they were walking up and saying, wow, this is really weird, the GDPR, it's like a single API to 28 countries. And it's like, yes, the EU, it's a trade block. The whole point of the GDPR was to improve the digital economy of the EU. The fact that they had to coordinate and make sure that we didn't let go of some important values, which are unfortunately not defended in my home country right now very well, doesn't mean that we weren't trying to make it easier to do business. Right? So anyway, that's me raving about governments and regulations. Let's hear about the EU regulations. This is actually a slide um, originally done by one of my collaborators, Helena Malakova, who kindly let me use it, and then I've, I've futzed with it a little bit. <laughs> the, um, the, uh, a lot of people are getting all excited about the AI Act, which is one of the things that's under development, but an awful lot of what we think about as AI regulation, when we worry about the kinds of things that people have been very good about worrying about here, are actually handled in other places. In fact, even if you were following the whole development of the AI Act through the you know, high-level expert group and this white paper and all that, in the white paper, like 40% of it was about liability. You look at the AI Act, zero, zero, well maybe one or two, I think the, the word occurs like twice. Why? Because we took the liability part out and we revised the existing Product Liability Act, right? Um, and that, and also we've added an, an AI Liability Act, which I'm not really sure why. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to keep up with all these things. But the Revised Product Liability Act and the AI Act really uh, come together neatly, right? They're set up to link to each other. And so when people say, well, why doesn't the AI Act talk about you know, human rights or more, or why doesn't it talk about the, the, the you know, sustainability more? It's because things like liability and ethics, you know, human rights and um, sustainability are so fundamental, they have their own acts, okay? So let's talk, I'm just gonna talk about three of these. I wanna talk first about the GDPR. A whole lot of what we, thought, we think about is actually in the GDPR when we think about AI you know, ethical regulation. So consent, uh, transparency, uh, the explainability, um, and also uh, there, there's already some stuff, yeah, the corrections. Um, and rights concerning automated processing, all right? So that, that was already not really data, but it's in the Data Protection Act. That you, have, that you aren't supposed to have, if a decision is based solely on automated processing, you ought to know how to get access to it. Now, this hasn't been enforced as much as we'd like to see it enforced, and that one piece, the automated processing piece, has been kind of extended a little bit more in the AI Act. But actually, a lot of what I was worried about, and part of the reason I went from, you know, from Bath to Berlin, because I thought we, need, we still need the EU to get this right, a lot of that is in the DSA. 
It's actually how do we deal with these really large companies, also the, the Digital Markets Act, but I won't talk about that. Um, the Digital Services Act is actually to, again, make sure that we have a digital economy that can keep growing, but will be safe, predictable, and trusted online environment, and they do it by defending our rights, and that particular things are regulating is profiling. So how much do you know about your user, right? And how, what, how do you handle that? I'm not gonna talk about that much. I will talk a little bit about recommendation systems, which is one of the biggest things going on in AI that we're worried about, right? We're worried about are we being pushed towards being extreme or pushed towards being liberal or pushed towards buying too much, right? Or pushed towards being too thin. <laughs> I, I ignored that one. <laughs> but anyway, and then also targeted advertising, right? Which is similar, all right? I, I would argue, in fact, I do frequently argue why, why who knows, uh, that, that Facebook and Twitter were a lot better when there was no art recommender at all, which was only, I think Twitter only brought in a uh, recommender algorithm on its main feed in like 2016 or 2017. It was really pretty recent. Um, what we used to have to do, which people who are trying to use Mastodon are learning, having to learn to do, is choose who to follow. And it wasn't just your friends, it wasn't like Facebook. You actually had to choose um, who was putting out interesting information at a rate that you could handle. I used to like sometimes tweet at people saying, you're so interesting, but please don't tweet so much, you know, because I, I only have so many hours in the day and I can't keep up with you. And they would be like, what? I have lots of followers, what are you writing, are you writing to me? And so anyway, then you found other people who were filters that retweeted the best things of those, you know? So you, it, was a, it was work, it was work. And sometimes people tell, I, tell me I'm elitist for thinking you should do that, right? But I still think it was important work that we were both curating what we said I still think the 120 characters thing was brilliant. It's like it raises the bandwidth if you have a tighter bottleneck. I can say that in this kind of room, right? <laughs> so, so it was important that we curated both what we said and what we read. And we had, we, and so you know, I still don't see the, most of the abuse that people talk about on Twitter um, because I still use lists. I don't, I don't read random stuff. So anyway, we can argue about that. We cannot argue about search. There's just, what even is search if it's not a recommender algorithm? Right? So definitely we need people to know, and we have to know whether or not, you know, when Google is uh, just showing us things, is it showing us the kinds of things that uh, we actually wanted to see, or are they biased towards the advertisers, or do they have political bias, or whatever? We need to know those kinds of questions about our search engines, for sure. And probably, if I'm right, if, if people are right that I'm being elitist, also about our social media. I think TikTok is entirely recommender too, right? That's part of its thing. Right, so no, you don't have to do any work. China will have to do the work for you. Okay, so um, yeah, targeted advertising. This is a weir weird thing to me, and maybe you guys know better than me. I'd love to hear about this in Q&A. Sometimes people are saying that there's no sales benefit. There's no advantage over using the target advertiser or not. You know, people forget to pay their bills, they're not in there, and they don't, they don't, they don't see any drop off in sales. How can this be? I mean, have you seen this? That all the money moved out of journalism into Google and Facebook, right? All of it. That's the, the, this is the people AI makes redundant. It's not because we did their job better, it's because we took away all their money, right? And yet, how, how would there have been this, how could this have happened? Um, I, I still don't understand it. Um, people believe they need the data about their, their customers, and maybe they do. Maybe they're improving their product somehow that I don't know about. Maybe there's other pressures going on. I was like, I, I don't know whether I should show this so you get this very pixelated version. But maybe there's all kinds of pressures about why we're gathering this kind of information, but I don't know. But I do know more about is the AI Act. So this is one I've been more uh, involved with. Um, so basically, it was supposed to be proportionate. And actually, in proportionate legislation, I'm um, oh, sorry, what was it? Risk-based. Risk-based is proportionate. Sorry, there we go. So, but somehow they invented a new kind of risk-based legislation, which, is, which has actual layers. And that's because they were pushed by companies who said, we want to know exactly what we have to do. Um, so the top layer famously is banned, and about the only two things that, that people really talk about banning is tracking everybody everywhere, which we know, again, China's trying to do. And actually, I'm pretty sure Britain does that at least with cars. Right? They have license, they, they, the license, the cameras and everything. They pretty much know where every car is all the time. But anyway, you're not supposed to do that. And social credit scoring, right? So, and, that, and again, you know, America does credit scoring all the time, but it's not one big government-based one. It's like multiple different things and you can appeal it, I guess, or whatever. 
although you can feel a Chinese one too. But um, interestingly, these things are also banned in the UNESCO AI recommendation, I think it's ethical AI recommendation, which came out, was signed in November 2022 by every member of UNESCO, which is every country in the world, which is including China, except the United States, because Trump pulled out of UNESCO. <laughs> okay. So, so, which is kind of nice because we got all this stuff through <laughs> that maybe the U.S. would have blocked. But anyway, um, so every country has agreed not to do these things. It's not just an EU thing. High risk actually is anything that affects, uh, I'm saying here, important human outcomes. So the EU people tend to say human outcomes, but it, as a scientist, I know everything we do affects humans. I mean, come on, <laughs> right? But anyway, it's stuff like, do you have access to loans? Do you have access to a job? Do you have access to welfare? Which school does your kid go to? Um, do, you know, what kind of medical advice do you get? These are the kinds of things that are considered high risk. And if it's high risk, you just have to do the kind of compliance, a little bit of documentation that most industries do anyway. So coming back to is AI even a product, right? You know, uh, the people who are in software are freaking out about this. The people who are like in medical devices or whatever are going like, that's all you have to do? <laughs> you know, that, that's just, it's just nuts, right? And th yeah, a lot of people in this room are in, you know, actually regulated sectors like banking or, or pharma or whatever, and they're nodding, right? <laughs> so, so it's really weird. Oh, I'm not going fast enough. Thank you. <laughs> so compliance um, is actually relatively low cost, and we, but can you take that away now? <laughs> but, uh, bring, bring it back in five minutes. Um, it's relatively low cost, and if you don't believe that, uh, you can see the numbers. Actually, my, my, uh, my collaborator here, my, my Mary Hetia. Uh, came up with, uh, but we, we, they're between, the EU said zero, and somebody else said like two billion or something, and we, it turns out it's like 100,000 or something. Um, but anyway, uh, there's no problems, the, the rest of the AI, if there's no problems, you need to ensure that users know they are working with AI. That's the one thing, and I really appreciate everybody who was harping on that yesterday. That is the one thing that's ob obligatory, is that you know whether, if you get a telephone, are you hanging up on a real person or are you hanging up on a robot, right? You got to know that. So that, that's, that's the uh, rule that you guys apparently don't all know. <laughs> but anyway, um, I would actually suggest for everybody who isn't yet classified as high risk that they do voluntarily do some of the proportionate documentation. It's ordinary DevOps, right? It's the kind of thing you want to keep track of. So I would say that it would be nice if the EU checked and, and saw that you were doing the right thing so that there was a path for very small companies to move towards um, more complicated or, or, or important AI if they wanted to. But that's just a recommendation on my part. So can AI be transparent or audited? This is, uh, do you guys, have you seen this? So there's a number of languages, including Turkish, which my co-author Eileen Kalaskan used this kind of example in our paper in science, um, but also Finnish, where he and she is the same word. And when it gets translated into English, it shows the, the bias that's in the word embedding. So this is just Google Translate, right? So the same word, but depending on whether you're investing or you're doing laundry, you, your, your expected gender just switches, all right? So like I said, Eileen did this, but I just love this one by whoever Volkov is. She's obviously Finnish. Um, but anyway, so this, like I said, we had a paper about this in 2017. And the thing that I wish people were a little clearer about is this isn't just like you know, evil people sitting around in California that are too white. <laughs> this is what the way the world is. This is one of the figures from our paper that somehow doesn't get talked about as much, so I'm going to talk about it here. So down the y-axis here is these evil sexist word embeddings that we've shown are just as bad, as, you know, all the same implicit biases as humans, right? So this is more masculine, this is more feminine according to evil sexist word embeddings. This is real life, okay? So these dots are jobs in the US labor statistics from 2015. Um, this is the internet, I think maybe one more build there. Yeah, this is the internet from 2016. And it's a pretty high correlation. And the thing is that the, the jobs, some of the labor, like domestic engineer, we just threw away the domestic and so you're an engineer, right? <laughs> so that's why there's some noise there. Uh, similarly, over here, this is, what, this is names. So this is just like Chris and Alice and Ashley. And you're saying, well, how many people named uh, Alice are male and how many are female? And you can see, again, these are incredibly high correlations. You know, for, for, for psychology, you never get things like this. And, and notice this is the 1990 census. That was the last time that we got proper names and genders in the US census. So I would actually treat this as a prediction. I would say that if you could, I bet you'd get like a, even 100% here. You just, you hear people say, 
Ashley she or Ashley he, and your brain keeps count, and that's where your implicit biases come from. And what we, that we think those are bad is because we've chosen and said, we don't want to be as sexist as we used to be. We don't want to be as racist as we used to be. But the data is coming from our lived experience. It's not just coming from like corrupt, evil data sets, okay? All right, so anyway, back to the, the thing about whether you can do anything about this. I think we should always be using simple, transparent algorithms that we could check. We know it's going to relive a lived experience. We know it's going to create stereotyped output. But then we can somehow define what fair is. Not easy, right? But once you've done that, you can either use some kind of explainable, human, readable hack. And anyway, then this whole thing is the translator. Or you, uh, I got the build in the wrong order, sorry. Or you could use machine learning. If that's what floats your boat, fine. But again, we need to make sure that everything, the whole thing is a translator. Do not be freaked out by the fact there's a bit of stereotyping in there. I'm very worried when people are pulling off corpora that have bad words in them off the internet um, and saying, oh, we can't train on this. And this means that there are subsets of our population we can't understand because that was ordinary language used by a subset of the population. And I'm referring to a particular uh, case in, in, with MIT, with a minority population data set, right? And people say, how could that evil stuff be in our AI somewhere? It's in our brains anyway. It's in our society. But then we just use something about the filtering. Great, thank you. So uh, do that again for two. <laughs> so as I mentioned, every step, we're, we, have, we have architectures. Every step should be audible and replicable. And we should know that we've met criteria with every step. But we don't have to make, solve all the problem with a single network. That's nuts. And it's not very transparent. OK, yeah, so digital assistants are easily transparent. We don't audit what every little weight does any more than when you walk into a bank and audit the bank, you say, show me how the brains work. What are the synapses doing for these different people, right? What we look at is processes. And again, I was just in Paris. The guy that is in charge of putting this stuff together, the audits for the AI Act, was saying, yes, it's going to be a process audit, right? So we're saying, are you using best practice processes, right? So good maintainable systems engineering of software requires architecture for the system. We know what the components are. We know where they were sourced, where they came from. We know that it's all secure, including the logs, the revision logs, so we can see who wrote it. But also, where do the data libraries come from? Where do the software libraries come from? The SolarWinds hack was like the company that sold the library to the company that sold the library to SolarWinds, right? So you need to have your entire pipeline, you know it's cyber secure. And then you document everything, including the tests. If you're running it in real time, it's, you know, this is like 1980s, okay, revision control is 1980s software engineering. Um, uh, build to test is 2000, you know, extreme programming or whatever. Um, why do AI companies not even, can't even replicate their own products? I don't know, <laughs> but I think it's going to end. Um, so this is the kind of stuff that we can do, and we can automate capturing this. I have people say, um, you know, you guys say that there's those files, there's revision control. You go into the companies, they're not there. Of course, okay, it's not every AI system you could make auditable if you kept track of that information, but you could also delete all that information and there's no way to audit it, right? But that is negligence under normal liability. You have to keep track of those records. So ordinary product law uh, it assumes that you do due diligence, right? And that's great. It's actually part of the reason that we don't have to worry about keeping improving the law. We are able to just say, well, we put something was in a trade journal and that's what the current best practice is, right? So, it, so the, the sector itself keeps improving itself. Um, I'm going to skip over this stuff about, about audits. It's a little complicated, but again, I feel like people don't understand AI because they're saying, oh, let's use risk audits and, and let's, let's start make a new product coming from risk audits. Why aren't you starting from cybersecurity? If your AI system isn't cybersecure, then forget everything else because somebody else could be doing anything else with it, right? Who cares what else you've done? if you haven't made sure that you're the one talking to, or your system is the one talking to your client, right? So I, anyway, I think people aren't thinking about this. I am worried about how are we gonna make sure that we have enough people who can read these logs? We don't even know, it's an open question. Can we make it sufficiently transparent that you don't even have to be a programmer, or do you at least not have to be a very good programmer? <laughs> Maybe we can get the weaker programmers to be the better auditors, who knows? Um, but anyway, the DSA makes you identify your own threats and find ways to mitigate them and then the regulator only checks your work. That's explicit there, and I think that might come in with AI Act too. Um, it's possible, remember, if you, even if the governments aren't, don't currently have the capacity to do these things, 
that they'll require you to keep the records, and eventually someone will maybe write some AI that will help them <laughs> be able to go back and do all the audits, right? So I think it's not as much of a disaster as it seems to be. So all I'm gonna say about, uh, it, we're, we heard a little bit about this in a panel last night. Um, I was on this robot on the left, I was working on this robot, and that's how I got into AI ethics, because people kept coming up to me and saying, oh, it would be uneth unethical to unplug that. And it wasn't plugged in, and it didn't work. It was basically a statue. This robot was nearby, it really did work. Nobody ever said that about that robot, okay? So I'm wondering, and, and I think people said this, that, that it's like a kind of polarization. People are looking for, I literally haven't rewritten this since she said that brilliant thing yesterday that I tweeted, in fact. Um, so there is something about identification that if we see something that reminds us of a human, like a dog, then um, if we treat it badly, then we tend to treat people badly. And this is something Kant identified years ago, so it's called like kind of Kantian ethical, whatever. And so people use this, yeah, the dogs aren't the ones judging, it's not about the dog, it's about how you treat other people is still what Kant thinks at the end of the day, right? But your treatment of the dog affects that. People take that and they say, therefore, we have to make sure that we treat AI really well because we over-identify with that too. And I think that's wrong for two reasons. One is we don't over-identify, as I said, with that other robot or with search or translation, right? Um, also, there is no way to hold AI uh, accountable or for it to defend its own rights. So this doesn't, it just isn't sensible. Um, I think the correct take is that that means we need to make it clear that people, we need to help people not identify with AI. And so one of the things I'm really, 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 really interested in right now is how can we help people understand what LLM are doing? And, and the, you guys who are worried about how to make them to products, exposing what you figured out to your customers if they ask could be a huge human service, right? Because as we understand that it's something that you can manipulate, and that, that, you know, that as we get that it's just a piece of code, then, that, then anyone who plays around with it can then hopefully get that intuition too. All right. So I'll skip over this again. It's the same thing I said before. It's just the cute pictures. The robots themselves, uh, I do believe there's something it's like to be a robot, but it's a lot less like what it is to be a human than it is to be a cow, if that makes sense. So <laughs> we're never going to build something with chips and wires with anything like the phenomenology we have, or at least not as close as a cow's is, or even a fruit flies. You know, fruit flies have all those little hairs, and they, they're dealing with lights and sound and stuff just like us. And we kill fruit flies. We eat cows, not all of us, some of us eat cows, right? We author an architect experience of AI, and so I would argue that we're obliged to make sure we are not obliged to the AI, and to let our customers know that. All right, so that's it. The summary is that AI is an ordinary product of human commerce. AI and processes for making it are auditable if we choose to keep adequate cybersecure records of what we've done. Law doesn't need to keep up with technology due diligence updates automatically with published innovations, right? Those selling components for systems could also be selling audit trails and transparency systems for their own products. And again, I've, I've been, had great conversations here with people providing middleware that are saying, yes, this is a product. Not only can we show that we're doing this, but we could be helping our customers show that they can do it too. So the AI Act is a business opportunity for a lot of people in this room. And yeah, that's what I just said. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. Um, give it another round for Julia. <laughs> Did I leave any time for uh, no, Q&A? Oh, well. yes. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, you can ask me questions on Twitter if you want. Yes. Or, or in person. <laughs> um, we'll take a few minutes to shuffle rooms if anyone would like, would like some time, and we'll begin in a few minutes.